Christopher Lee, you made more than 20 films with Peter Cushing, and I know that people ask you about him a lot. Um, of all the things you remember about Peter, what do you think would surprise people the most? Surprise people, I would think, probably our conversations on the telephone. Uh, because the kind of characters that he usually used to play uh, in films, and certainly the ones that I did with him, were apt to be somewhat austere, to say the least, and clinical sometimes even quite cold-blooded in some respects. Uh, even Holmes is not a particularly attractive character, you know, if you really look at him closely. I think what would surprise people would be not just the fact that we had a wonderful personal relationship, because I think everybody knew that, but it would be the telephone conversations. Because I remember one day and I'm not quite sure how it happened. Um, I'd seen an animated cartoon, and I loved, and still do, good ones. And I had a great, uh, I was a great devotee of uh, Sylvester and the Tweety Pie. And also, of course, Bugs Bunny and um, Tom and Jerry and Spike the Bulldog. Well, I, I have a gift for mimicry, let's put it that way. And I remember one day saying to Peter, just by chance, I don't remember where, I don't remember when, but I think it was in the studio, uh, that I'd just seen this scene in which Sylvester uh, was left behind in the house by mistake. Everybody had gone, and he couldn't get out. And he frantically opened all the cupboards in the house, and all that was in it was bird seed. And for some reason, for, for the treaty pie, you see, and so for some reason, I said to Peter, this had made me laugh. He said, well, what do you mean? What way? And I said, well, bird feed. I'm going to tar, if you see, which is the way Sylvester speaks. And he completely collapsed. I thought it was the funniest thing he'd ever heard. So from then on, we went to animated films together, and there was a place in Piccadilly. And we were asked to leave once, actually, because we were <laughs> laughing so much and telling each other, you know, almost imitating the characters on the screen under our breath. The last time I ever saw him, the last thing that he ever did with me was after we'd done this program about Hammer down in this small studio in Canterbury because he wasn't well enough to come to London. He lived at Bristol, which was fairly close. I brought two of these cartoons down, two of his favorites. And he sat there in front. And I played these two. And I waited for his reaction, and he was a dying man. And he just fell apart just like he always did. So when I used to call him, I was one of the few people who had his own number, he would answer. He didn't like talking on the telephone. And he would answer with a rather strangled voice, as if it was somebody else, you see. He would say, hello, oh, or something rather like that <laughs> along those lines. Whereupon I would either do Sylvester, or I would do Spike the Bulldog about his son, that's my boy, <laughs> which was another thing that he loved. He used to do that too. Or I would do the laugh, you see, <laughs> or whatever it was. And he'd, he'd just fall about on the other end of the line. It kept him going to a certain extent, so I used to do it as often as I could. And then he would do his imitations. What people would think if those telephone conversations had been recorded, and I wish they had, they would not believe that it was us, because he would, there would be terrible silence when I would know that he was literally shaking with laughter so much mm -hmm. that he couldn't speak. And then he would say, I, I've got to stop. You'll have to ring me back, or I have to ring you. I'm ringing, but I've got to go and take a bath. <laughs> so that, I think, would probably be the most surprising mm. element in our relationship, as far as the general public is concerned. And uh, as far as his acting was concerned, he was absolutely brilliant with props. I'm not. 
I prefer not to use them at all unless it's absolutely essential. Well, he was nicknamed Props Peter, wasn't he? Well, I didn't know reason. that, but, yes. but it, I think very appropriate. Uh, I always said to him, you know, you can light your pipe, drink your whiskey, read the newspaper, deliver your dialogue, and have two or three oranges in the air like a juggler, all at the same time, and I do wish you'd stop doing this, because I can't do any of it. <laughs> he loved his props. If you watch him carefully in films, I mean, he never overdid it, but he was always doing something, and it meant something. Whether he was taking his handkerchief out, or putting his spectacles on, or whether he was smoking a cigarette, which of course Holmes did, or pipe, well, Holmes actually pipes. It didn't matter what it was, it was always right. He was absolute master of that sort of thing. But he used to drive me to the borders of madness while all this was going on yeah. in front of me. Yes. And I knew that I couldn't do anything remotely like it. And I said that in the nicest way, of course. Uh, I couldn't do anything like it. I wasn't even going to attempt to. And he would, I mean, how do you smoke a pipe, drink your drink, and deliver your dialogue all at the same time? Because that's the impression that he mm. gave me. And that's when I used to say to him, you're at it again, you know, you're at it again. And he used to be a great one for doing this, the finger. He, d he d sort of swept it up like that. And I always remember the scene from The Hound of the Baskervilles oh, yes. when he did that in front of me and said, remember, Sir Henry, or where's that effect, you must never go out on the moor at night. He was also a great man for pronouncing his T's. So I used to kid him sometimes, we couldn't shoot. And I, I would do another line, which was like that, let's say, and I would repeat that line and in a rehearsal. And I would say, and remember, Professor, do not go out on the moor tonight. <laughs> See, of course, that mm. finished him off again. Well, I understand from reading his autobiography that he taught himself to speak properly, as he put it. He, I didn't know that. When he was a young man, he was apparently ashamed of the way he spoke. I, believe. I think the saddest thing about Peter was something he never talked about. I'm not talking about the death of his wife which was the end of his life as far as he was concerned. He only waited from 1971 to 1994 to join her. That was all he thought about. Um, his family, he never talked about the fact that he was a very good rugby player, I understand, and loved the game. He never talked about his family, he never mentioned his parents. And one day I, for some reason, said to him, uh, do you have any family? Alive? Yes. But say anything else. And I sort of kind of pressed it a bit and I said, uh, really, do you have any? Uh, I know you don't have any children. Didn't adopt any children, you and Helen, but I mean, what, what about uh, cousins or brothers or sisters or something like that? He said, well, I do have a brother, yes. And there was another silence. I said, oh, really? I didn't know that. What does he do? He said, he lives in the country. And he said, he, he farms. He's a farmer. I said, well, where? And he said, oh, in the West Country. And I said, oh, well, do you see him? He said, no. Very, 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 very seldom. And there was such sadness in his voice, I didn't quite know how to go on. So I said, oh, that's... Very sad. Um, I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, do you mind if I ask why? I'll never forget the answer. See, because his wife does not approve of what I do. In other words, the old thing, act as rogues and vagabonds. Mm. And she didn't want to be associated any more than my mother did, I can assure you. <laughs> Although she was the greatest dramatic actress I've ever met in my life, but she wasn't a <laughs> professional one. Now, early in your career, you shared <coughs> screen credits with uh, Peter on a couple of films, even though you hadn't actually met well, each other. One, I mean, he had a very important part, which he played brilliantly in Hamlet, where he played Osric, and I was an unauthorised extra holding a spear. <laughs> I really did. And um, the other, of course, was Moulin Rouge, mm. which we were both in, and we both had different scenes to appear in. And frankly, I can't even remember his. I'd seen him in his 
unforgettable performance in 1984, which he played Winston Smith. I'll never forget his reaction. I don't think he ever bettered it to the rat in the cage mm. of such horror and fear and terror that uh, he was able to use on subsequent occasions from time to time. But this was really remarkable. And he was a very established actor. You have to remember that before actor. the war, oh yes, yes. But, but he'd done a lot of the theater too. You also have to remember that before the war, he was in a Laurel and Hardy film, Indeed. Chumps at Oxford. And if you watch it, as I did the other day, simply because of him, it's very clearly him and he hadn't changed. Mm. Not at all. Uh, I'm playing a rather mean kind of student at the university. Uh, it's, it's a funny movie, but then, of course, they were the masters for me. They were the masters. They were a double act. We weren't. Many people thought you were, though, didn't no, they? No, but we weren't. We Many casting went. directors certainly well, did. Can't, don't get me onto the subject of casting directors, <laughs> please. They just don't do their homework. The fact that Peter Cushing and Christopher Lee, between them, made a lot of very well-known films which were internationally popular throughout the entire world, virtually, depending on the censorship. I mean, nothing was shown in Scandinavia for years. Uh, and we made whatever it was, 22, something like that, films together, which have since some of them become classics and very popular uh, with the new generation, which is even more important. We were never a double act, never, remotely. He was totally unlike me. I was totally unlike him. We were totally unlike as people. We didn't look like each other. We didn't play off each other like Laurel and Hardy did, like double acts do. Because when you talk about a double act, you're talking about slapstick comedy. You're talking about Martin and Lewis, Abbott Costello, Laurel and Hardy, whatever, whatever. Those are double acts, yes, because mm -hmm. they couldn't function without the other, or very seldom. But we could, and we did. In fact, you said to me once that you felt your characters worked best when they were in opposition to oh, each yes. other. Oh, definitely. Definitely. I mean, sometimes... Let's not forget this. Sometimes Peter was the villain. Indeed. I was the victim. Indeed. Particularly in the first one. Because of Frankenstein. Oh, without a doubt. Um, when I played the creature, so often incorrectly called the monster. Well, the curse and of that Frankenstein. That goes back, of course, to and, the original. And Dracula changed a lot for both of you. I mean, Peter oh, yeah. was already an established television star. I, I it wasn't. really made your name, didn't it? It I did, think. yes. Um, but I was... Um, I've been trying to learn my craft uh, for about 10 years. And I'd worked in all sorts of places, all over Europe in different languages, singing, acting, sweeping the stage, working in rep, working in the theater. In other words, learning, something that few, sadly, few young actors and actresses are prepared to do these days. So many of them are stars before they even make their first film. And you know when you look at them on the screen that they are looking in a mirror, absolutely in a mirror. And it's the uh, beginning of a lifelong romance. And their hand is out underneath the mirror, out of shot. Because that's what they want, rich. Mm. To be rich and famous immediately, which is terribly sad and extremely dangerous. The most dangerous thing that a young actor or actress can do is to believe their own publicity. Mm. Because shelf life, 10 years. Mm. If you're a star, 20 or 22 or three or four. I if you haven't got it, mm. if you've got it, if you've got the right instincts, the right imagination, the right powers of invention, if you have something behind you, some sort of foundations of experience and versatility, that's fine. You will go on, you will last. But if you haven't, and the majority has not got these qualities, and you always play the same part basically or, basically, or slight variations on it, and that's all you can do, you'll be through in 10 years or even five when the public will eventually say, well, you know, they're always doing the same thing. Mm. And the moment that's, that happens, it's the beginning of the end. You start at the top of the ladder. There's only one way to go. Well, this must have been a concern for you and Peter in the 1950s when the what we might call the horror boom, started. I mean, do you think that Peter's typecasting enriched his typecast. career? So did was it I. enrich his career or did it restrict oh, yeah. it, do you think? 
Well, it restricted him as an actor. It restricted me as an actor. Although he knew far more about the art of acting than I did, I learned fairly rapidly. But um, <laughs> I remember when I accepted the part of the creature in The Curse of Frankenstein, I did it not only just to play a part, where I wasn't too tall or too foreign looking, as I was told all the time, by our brilliant producers in this country and the executives of the rank organization. Uh, I thought to myself, well, you've learned quite a bit in 10 years, but you haven't made a name for yourself. Nobody really knows who you are. They don't put the face and the name together. There's no reason why they should. But if this works, people will say, I wonder what he really looks like. It, it did work. It did happen. And then they wondered what I really looked like. And lo and behold, I did something like The Hound of the Baskervilles. Mm. Well, there I was, looking like me. Mm. So I, I did consciously make a point out of this. I also remember going to his dressing room for the first time, fully made up, brandishing the script and saying to him, I haven't got any lines. I've got nothing to say. And he looked up at me and he said, you're lucky, I've read the script. Which, of course, was exactly the right thing to say to me at the time. But of course he'd read it, otherwise he wouldn't have accepted it. <laughs> now, I suppose one of the differences between you and Peter at that point was that the Hammer films made your name, mm. I think. Whereas Christopher, uh, sorry, Peter, as we've already discussed, was a big star in television already. And they oh, really yeah. changed the course of his career. Do you think that he was as concerned as you became about his typecasting? The answer to that is I don't know, because I never asked him. Uh, I think he was happy, like all actors are, to work, of course, to doing something interesting, to have a challenge, because if you don't have a challenge, there's no point in performing. Mm. Everything must be a challenge, every single one. I mean, I've done something like, I don't know what the figure is, but I was told it was nearly 300 the other day, things I've forgotten. It doesn't matter whether it's something I did when I didn't really know what I was doing or whether it was something I did a few weeks ago. Everything is a challenge, and it must be. Otherwise, forget it. Because if it does come off, then you have, to a certain extent, won the battle. Mm. I think he felt like that. You know, he, he felt, well, I'm an actor. I want to act. Lots of things I can do. Sometimes I'm going to get the chance of doing something that people don't expect. Like, for instance, playing Holmes. Although there's an element of Baron Frankenstein in Sherlock Holmes. Mm. That cold, calculating mm. approach to the problem, mm. whatever it might be. And, uh, of course, he wasn't in the least bit like that. In real life, he was a warm, generous, kind, decent, honorable man. And I miss him terribly. I miss those ridiculous telephone conversations more than anything else, really, because there's no one alive now with whom I can have those conversations. And I miss him as a friend, I miss him as an actor, I miss him as a colleague. He was greatly loved, not just respected and admired, but greatly loved. And I think that's one of the reasons why he went on working, not because he wanted to be loved. He may not even have been aware of it. He was a very humble person. But I think he just loved being an actor. As to whether he thought that he was being typecast and he shouldn't go on playing the same sort of character, not necessarily the same one, I really don't know the answer because I never asked him. I probably told him what I thought about my situation with these eternal Dracula films coming up, the last four of which I refused point blank to do. Uh, a lot of people won't be aware of this, but I have said it before. The first one was 57, and the second one was 65, which I didn't speak at all because I refused to say the dialogue, which was quite beyond belief. And um, then I was asked to do and did, I think, three or four more, I forget now, I can't remember. And I turned them all down and refused to do them. And I got frantic telephone calls from Hammer. I mean, really frantic. 
one of which I can say now because he's no longer with us, Jimmy Carreras, I was very fond of him, saying I'm 61 or two years of age, the strain is too much for me, I can't stand this, I'm on my knees begging you, you've got to do it, you've got to do it, you've got to do it. And I said, I haven't got to do it, I don't want to do it, Jimmy. Why, why, why? I said, because this is not Bram Stoker, you've written the story first, you've stuck the character in, I've got nothing to do, it's totally wrong and I don't want to do it and I'm not going to, goodbye. More frantic telephone calls. And then the truth came out, that he had sold the picture to the American distributor on condition that I played the part. And then, which he said to me over the telephone, it was a monstrous thing to say, really. Think of the people who put out of work if you don't do this film. It's a terrible thing to say to anyone in any business. And I thought, well, I can't be held responsible for putting 90 people out of work. That is the only reason I did those extra films beyond the first two. I've said it before, a lot of people don't print it, they don't say it, but now I'm saying it again, and it's the truth. Well, regardless of the quality of those um, final few films, it's nice that you were reunited with Peter for the last oh, two yes. Draculas that you yes. did. Yes, although it was totally wrong. And I would desperately try in every film to get in the, a line from Stoker. And I succeeded, I think, in one of them. Me who's commanded thousands or something like that. Yes, in the last uh, one, in fact. The last one, was it? Yes. When everything was on fire all around us and so yes. on. Yes. Oh, gosh, yes. It was... Uh, I wasn't happy doing those films. I don't think he was either. I don't think he was either. One kind of felt, you know, like you're taking the same train journey every day, you know. Yeah. Nothing, is, nothing is changing. The stories were changed, but not to accommodate us which is exactly the wrong way of going, around, going about it. But I never found out because I never asked him. You didn't work with him very much when your graveyard period came to an end, but one director... No, I mean, it really came to an end in 1970, although I did do my last Hammer film in 1975 to The Devil a Daughter, which was completely and utterly ruined in the last 10 minutes by some senseless and idiotic decisions made by some genius somewhere connected with Hammer, or I don't know, but it was. And Dick Widmark came to London, I think it was either earlier this year or last year, National Film Theatre, and he started talking about that. Did he? Yes, he did. He hadn't forgotten it. He said, I can't believe what a mess they made of that movie. Dennis Wheatley, of course, was, I think the word now is incandescent with rage, whereas he loved The Devil Rides Out. Mm. Gave me a first edition of the book. Um, no, I, I'm not sure we... Well... Well, you did occasionally. Well, we, well, we did occasionally. Well, we, we did, did Arabian we did, of Adventure. Course. Uh, of course. That's right. Arab Arabian Adventure and Nothing With The Night. Indeed, yes. Yes. And a film before its time. Very much a cult film. A film that you produced yourself, in fact. Well, I was, yes. And uh, Once Was Enough. <laughs> and... Um, I can't remember after that. That was probably well, the last one, one. One director that you both worked with, albeit in different films, was George Lucas, of course. Oh, yes. And I've heard stories. I have no idea if it's true or not, because uh, you hear stories all the time. I've heard very interesting stories about this next film, which, as far as I know, I have completed episode three. But there's a very distinct possibility, as has happened in every case, that when George comes back here in March, who knows? because he's already said he will be, and he did the last time, and the time before that. I don't know if I finished. I just don't know. But, well, your, your but he was in the first one. Of your course. two Star Wars films are, of course, prequels, prequels to the one that Peter was in. That's right, because his, in fact, was the last one. It was episode four. I'm sorry, I've got it all mixed up. His, when I said the last one, I didn't mean that. I meant it came afterwards. Indeed. It was episode four, which he played... <laughs> This character with this wonderful name, the Grand Moff Tarkin, and played it, of course, extremely well, and endeared himself to everybody. <laughs> I remember ringing him up, these telephone conversations again, and saying, what is a Grand Moff Tarkin? He said, I haven't the remotest idea, dear boy. <laughs> dear fellow, dear fellow. He used to write me wonderful notes, dear fellow. And always at the end, may God's blessing be with you. Our, as ever, our love, Helen and Peter. Always. 
Even after Helen died? Oh, right up to the last time we spoke or he wrote. And I have a photograph. I have quite a few taken, of course, during that recording. And um, he is laughing. He's not putting it on. He is laughing. But there's a photograph of the two of us uh, at the entrance to the studio. I have it at home. I, I think it came out of a magazine. I don't have the original. And it really upsets me to look at it. Because we're both standing in the doorway, and I'm pretty much the same height as I am now. I got my arm around him, and this was in 1994, which is, well, nearly 10 years ago. And I got my arm around him. And the top of his head is more or less just above the level of my shoulder. And he was six feet tall. He had shrunk so much, he'd been so desperately ill and born it with such great courage. I mean, he became an institution at Whitstable. His funeral took place in the main street. I wasn't in the country, so I couldn't go. And they've got a bench there named after him. And he used to go to the Tudor rooms or whatever they were called every single day for his lunch and possibly his dinner. And no, the, the Broughtons um, cooked his meals for him, kept an eye on him. They were wonderful. Uh, but every day, I think he'd have lunch in the Tudor tea rooms. Mm. And people used to come up and talk to him, and he was quite happy about it. I think he used to have to sneak out the back sometimes. Well, yes, I suppose so, yes. I've had to do that myself on occasions. <laughs> Has it ever occurred to you that in years to come, when people watch the Star Wars films back to back, Star Wars may be perceived as your final collaboration with him in a strange way? Well, in a way, although we're not in the same film. Mm. And Lucas, in his introduction, your book on me, the authorised screen history, did something that he's never done before, to the best of my knowledge. He's never written an introduction to a book about an actor. But he does mention, if my memory serves me correctly, that he'd used Peter Cushing. And then he felt that it was inevitable that he would use me. Mm. Although there was 77, was it, to, what was it, 2000. So that's a 23-year gap. I think he wanted to fill that gap. Well, I think we're all very glad he did. Mm. Christopher Lee, thank you very much. Not at all.